Hi, welcome back. When I started these updates a couple of weeks ago, actually four weeks ago, I did not expect them to last that long, but I should have known better. Because I started posting on my blog on September 17th of 2008. I know that sounds like a 21st century idea, but I started writing about my experiences. And part of the reason I did that on September 17th, 2008, was a week into that particular crisis. And I wanted to put on paper what I was feeling at that moment, what I was uncertain about, what I was trying to learn. I didn't expect my post to last more than a few weeks, and I expected getting back to normalcy by October, October and November of 2008. And of course, 10 years later, I was still talking about the debris left over from that crisis. So I shouldn't be surprised that this one has lasted five weeks and perhaps will leave its imprint in the decade to come. Unlike my four previous updates so on this one, I'm going to talk about an up week because the previous four weeks were down weeks. The last week was an up week. So I'm going to talk about an up week, but it's an up week with a lot of volatility. So it still felt like the pit of your stomach was being tested through the week. It was also a week that around the world you saw governments announce bailout packages to bail out individuals and companies in trouble. And every government around the world was also thinking about what to demand in return for the bailouts. In the US at least, much of the debate centered around whether companies should be continued, should continue to buy back stock and whether buybacks were the culprit that had caused many of these companies to be in the trouble that they were in. So I'm going to try to deal with all of those in this particular update, but I'm going to start, like all of the other updates, by reviewing what the last week brought. First, let's look at the equity indices. Around the world, stocks had a good week. The Americas and Australia did much better than the rest of the world, reflecting the fact that the previous week was among the worst weeks for those particular regions. The Nikkei, actually, the Japanese market, was the best performing market of the week. If you look at U.S. Treasuries, it was a more settled week than prior weeks, but the, uh, the entry of the Fed, the aggressive actions it was taking, clearly, uh, clearly had an impact. At the low end of the Treasury curve, three-month bills, uh, one-month bills, you started to see zero, numbers close to zero or even negative values. And at the high end of the curve, the, the longer maturities, 10, and, the 10 years and 30 years, you saw rates come down. The yield curve still remained upward sloping. Now, if you look at the corporate bond market, the corporate bond market had a much quieter week last week. In fact, the spreads were jumped in the previous week. Because if you remember, the story in my fourth update was about how people woke up to the fear that there would be a ton of defaults. That fear subsided somewhat, and especially at the higher rated bonds. So if you look at the AAA, the AA, the, the single, triple Bs, you see a drop in spreads. As you go to the higher, uh, higher yields, the lower rated bonds, you saw the spreads not decrease as much, but it was a quieter week for corporate bonds. So stocks had a good week, treasury bonds had a good week, corporate bonds had a good week. Let's keep looking at commodities. The two commodities I've focused on in, uh, in my updates have been oil and copper. Oil, of course, has had a tremendous, a tumultuous six weeks where the price of oil has dropped by 60%. Last week was no exception. Oil continued to drop as Russia and Saudi Arabia continued their war over the future of oil. Copper, which is another commodity tied to the global economy, had a quiet week. And if you look at copper versus oil, you can see much of the damage in oil is coming out of self-inflicted wounds by the oil producers fighting with each other. We'll see what next week brings on these commodities. But oil, I think, has become the center of the commodity storm, and it's facing much worse pain than any other commodity. Now, looking at gold and millennial gold, which is what I've termed Bitcoin, you can see that both gold and Bitcoin had a decent week. Bitcoin, of course, is a much deeper hole to dig itself out of. So if you look across the entire six-week period, and I traced this crisis to February 14th of 2020, ironically, Valentine's Day, you essentially get, or the day after Valentine's Day, you essentially get the equivalent, no, February 14th is Valentine's Day. I'm, I'm sorry. But if you, if, if you trace out the effects, you can see that Bitcoin is down substantially over the six weeks and gold is not. So those are the big markets. Let's now look at equities broken down by region, by sector, by industry and see what we can, what, what, the, what the last week delivered. If you look across the regions of the world, you see that almost every region had a good week last week. 
Well, of course, some parts of the world, the UK, the US and uh, Japan had the, you know, and you saw that in the indices as well, had much better weeks than everybody else. But if you look at the entire time period, you can still see that China is the standout. It's got the, it's had the least damage over the six week period. And the rest of the world has seen substantial damage with losses ranging 20 to 30 to close to 40 percent. Collectively, global stocks clawed back about six billion dollars of the, I'm sorry, 5.1 billion dollars, uh, 5.1 trillion dollars in value last week, but they remained down almost 21 trillion over the six week period. So that's basically the breakdown by region. Let's look at the breakdown by sector. If you look at the breakdown by sector again, you look, it, it, it does make sense. The worst damage sectors tend to be, it's it tended to be real estate, it tended to be energy until last week. Real estate is now starting to catch up as a sector that is pretty damaged. Last week, though, was a very good week for the most levered sectors, kind of to make up for the previous week where they got damaged a lot. So you look across sectors, again, there isn't a single sector that's been left unscathed. Even sectors like utilities, we, which we used to think of as safe sectors, have been damaged substantially over the six-week period. Now, if you break, it, break the sectors down further into industries and you look at the biggest winners and the biggest losers, not much change on the list. You find that the big infrastructure businesses remain among the worst affected businesses. So the top 10 uh, worst affected businesses are at the, uh, the top of the list. And if you look at the bottom of the list, you see the sectors that have been least damaged, food processing, household products, online retail. And what, I mean, in a sense, you see less discretionary products have been affected less by this crisis. Again, something to be expected. Now, I want to focus on classifying companies. If you remember in previous weeks, I looked at low P versus high P, low momentum versus high momentum. And I really did not find much difference across the groups in terms of damage done. Last week, I looked at highly levered versus lightly levered companies, and I did find the relationship. The, the companies that have been most damaged in this crisis, especially if you bring in what happened last week, the, you know, the, in the week of, the, to, I think, March 13th to March 20th, if you are the most highly levered companies. This week, though, I want to focus in on a different classification built around this debate about buybacks. The presumption from a lot of people, often based on anecdotal evidence, is companies have brought much of the damage on themselves. In fact, if you look at the most damaged companies, by using cash to buy back stock. I think the story goes that if they hadn't used that cash to buy back stock and held the cash, I guess as cash, that they would not be in the trouble. And that's clearly true, right? In hindsight, if the airlines had not bought back stock and had just held the cash as cash, they'd be in a much better position. That's very selective 2020 vision because what if instead of buying back stock, they'd made investments instead? After all, one of the arguments made by people who are against buybacks is buying back stock is bad because companies don't invest more. Would airlines be in less trouble if they'd expanded more over the last 10 years? I'll leave that for you to decide. But this has become one of those central questions is, are buybacks contributing to the crisis? And if so, shouldn't it show up in the numbers? So here's what I did. I took all publicly traded companies in the world. I, I put a cutoff of 5 million, you know, because below 5 million, you get very illiquid companies, many of which you can't even trust the trading. And I have about 37,000 companies in my sample. And I broke them down into companies that bought back stock in 2009 and did not buy back stock in 2009. Very simplistic comparison, not the strongest test in the world, but I wanted to see whether companies that bought back stock have been more damaged during this crisis than companies that did not buy back stock. And at least based on the numbers, there seems to be some evidence that companies that bought back stock did worse than companies that did not buy back stock. Globally, companies that bought back stock saw their market caps drop about 25%, whereas the companies that did not buy back stock saw their market caps drop by 21%. Not a huge difference, but still a difference. But I also decided to do another categorization to see if it was buybacks that were the issue. 
I classified companies into whether they paid dividends or did not pay dividends. Remember, the conventional wisdom is dividend-paying stocks are safer. That if you want safety, you go to the highest dividend-paying stocks. So I wanted to see whether that held. And here again, the evidence is very similar to the buyback evidence. Companies that pay dividends, in, paid dividends in 2009 saw their market caps drop by roughly the same differential as the companies that bought back stock. This has been a very strange crisis in terms of what kinds of companies are being punished. It's not the smallest, most risky companies. The companies that you tend to think of as solid companies, safe companies, we see the punishment kind of meted out, at least when you look in terms of cash return. Finally, I focused on U.S. stocks because U.S. stocks, after all, are the biggest buyers back of their own stock. Is that even the right term? You know, you know what I mean. So essentially, I looked at U.S. stocks, and then I brought in the debt dimension, and here's why. Those people who make arguments against buybacks also make a couple of statements about buybacks that I don't think are true, but I'll come back and address them much more directly in another post on dividends and buybacks. Their argument is U.S. companies have been borrowing money and buying back stock, so it's not just the buyback, but the buybacks creating debt that is going to make these companies vulnerable. So what I did was I broke companies down, in, based on how much debt they had and whether they were buying back stock or not. So two dimensions, how much debt do you have and whether you buy back stock or not. And then I compared how much market caps have dropped at these classes of companies across, and compared them to each other. So let me give you the two groups of companies where you see the biggest difference between buyback stocks and stocks that don't buy back. If you look at companies with negative EBITDA, negative EBITDA in 2019, even pre-crisis. And you look at stocks within this group that bought back, companies that bought back stock and companies that did not. Companies that bought back stock saw their values drop by about 31%, whereas companies that did not buy back stock saw their values drop only 24%. 31 versus 24, you're saying, there, I told you so. Companies that shouldn't be buying back stock were going out and buying back stock. Well, wait a moment, though. If you look at the other class where you see a big difference, it's the companies with the least debt. So the companies with negative EBITDA and the companies with the least debt are the two groups where you see buyback companies do substantially worse than non-buyback companies. Put simply, there is no strong evidence in this table that buybacks by themselves are creating any additional friction. I know that there are companies where you can point to anecdotal evidence, United Airlines, if they hadn't bought back stock, but I think you're holding everything else constant when you make that argument. Again, this is not a complete assessment of dividends versus buybacks. That'll have to wait for, my, for another post on just the topic. But I think people are using this particular crisis as an argument for creating major corporate finance changes are essentially using this platform to create changes that will do more harm than good. So we'll come back and address that more in a future post. But we are in a position of uncertainty. So here's what I'd like to do to close this session. Like all of my other updates, I want to get my eyes off where we are now to where we will be. I want to focus on the future and in a sense return to basics. So let's start with, with some realities we face when we sit down to value companies now. One is that the data we have to value these companies seems dated, even though it's recent. Let me explain. When you sit down to value Boeing, the 2019 annual report just came out a few weeks ago. And that's true for a lot of U.S. companies. Now, in terms of when you got those financials, it was very recent. We have recent data, but that data seems almost useless because we know 2020 is going to create huge, huge damage to, the, to those revenues and income numbers. So there's data, it's historical data, but you don't know whether you can even use it. Second, we know almost beyond debate that 2020 is going to deliver bad news for most companies. Bad news in what sense? They're going to see revenues drop because how can they not? If you shut the economy down for two to three months out of the 12 months, how can revenues not drop? And Forget about operating money. You're going to lose money. Most companies are. You're going to see big operating losses in some case. Those losses and drop in revenues are going to put the survival of some companies at risk. Failure, which is often ignored in valuation, has to be front and center in the value of many of these companies. And finally, we know that once we come out of the virus, the economy that's going to exist is going to be different than the economy that we went into. How do we know that? Every crisis has that effect. It changes the landscape. 
So that landscape will actually be better for some companies. I mean, people often think about, and then talk about Amazon, talk about its history as a long and glorious history of success. What they don't realize is how much Amazon's current stature and success as a company comes from the dot-com bust. You heard me right. It's not the dot-com boom that made Amazon the company it is today. It's a dot-com bust. Because here's what the dot-com bust in 2001 did. It destroyed all of Amazon's online competition. And it, made, it damaged its brick-and-mortar retail companies so badly that they went into their shells and Amazon took advantage. There will be winners who come out of this crisis, who will come out stronger, in terms of competitive advantages and revenue growth and margins. And one of the things we need to start thinking about is who those winners will be. So let's go back to basics. Because once you face uncertainties like this, I describe this as the dark side beckoning. Because when, if your concept of valuation is to download last year's numbers into an Excel spreadsheet and do modeling, you are going to be completely and totally lost in your valuation. And most people have given up. Their argument is there's too much uncertainty, the fundamentals don't matter, let's wait. And if you do that, you're ripe for what I call the dark side. What happens in the dark side? People talk about paradigm shifts. They tell you the basics don't matter, the fundamentals don't matter. And you're going to be completely at the mercy of mood and momentum. Ironically, it's when you're most uncertain that you need to go back to basics. So you ready? Let's go back to basics. We know what drives the value of a company. It's cash flows and, and the risk in the company. So essentially, when I value a company, there are four drivers I've always used. Revenue growth reflect how quickly you can scale up. Your margins reflecting how profitable you are as a company. Your reinvestment efficiency, how efficiently can you deliver your growth by looking at a number called you know, how much revenues you get per dollar of capital invested. And I discount the cash flows I get from this analysis at a cost of capital that reflects both how risky you are as a company and what the price of risk is in the market. I've, I've built a spreadsheet that effectively bring these, in, bring these in. You've seen me use that spreadsheet to value companies before. If you get a chance, go and visit my Tesla valuation from the start of 2020. It's something I've always done. So I started thinking about how would I adapt the spreadsheet for the post-corona world? Because we know that this, this, this crisis is going to create some short-term issues, issues that potentially could put your company at risk. So what I've done here is adapted my spreadsheet for what I think the changes you will have to bring in to value a company. So let's start at the top. When I think about growth, first I have to ask myself, how will this crisis affect my operations near term? Let's define the near term as the next 12 months. How much will my revenues grow in the next 2020? And that could be a negative number. How much will my margins be in 2020? And that could be a negative number as well. Second question I'm going to ask myself is much more long term. How will this crisis change the landscape that my company operates in? The business it's in, it's standing. Because that's going to drive the revenue growth I give them post 2020. It might be entirely possible that because of this crisis, my companies could have higher revenues and higher margins in 2025 than they would have pre-crisis. So that's the cash flow effects, revenue growth and margins. If you go below the line, there are two things to factor in. One is this crisis has increased the price of risk substantially. So you need to update your risk premiums if you're computing what the cost of your equity is and the default spreads. And I've updated that to reflect the numbers as of today, today being March 31st of 2020. It also has increased the chances that your company might not make it. So one of the things I need to ask is how will this crisis affect the chances of my surviving? And if I don't survive, what will I get as equity investors? I'm going to add this front end to my basic valuation spreadsheet. And I built a spreadsheet that you can download. You see the link there, which has these inputs built in. And it has a video guide that goes with it that you can watch. It leads you cell by cell through the spreadsheet. As you sit down to use the spreadsheet to value whatever company, whether it's Boeing or United Airlines or you know, Reliance or whatever company you pick, you're going to find yourself constantly questioning yourself. And here's what you're going to be asking. How do I know what's going to happen? And you know what? You don't. No one does. You're going to be wrong 100% of the time, but that's okay because you don't have to be right to make money. You just have to be less wrong than everybody else. So use the information you have. Be bold. Make your best estimates. Remember that you'll get a chance to revisit these numbers in future periods. And 
take on. I mean, th one of the nice things about doing this is you will start to get a little more control over your investing life. And in periods like that, that'll keep you sane. So I hope you found the session useful and thank you for listening.